Greetings to all of you. I want to welcome all of us at Center Street Church, those of us here at Center Campus, as well as those joining us from our campus in Bearspa, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and South Calgary. I also want to say hello to those who are watching us online. Uh, we have been studying the book of Exodus for over a year now, and we are in the latter half of the book. At the beginning of the book of Exodus, the Israelites were down and out. They were crushed by the iron hand of Pharaoh, receiving unfair treatment, held under bondage. The people cried out to God in their distress. Then God showed up, and He intervened in a remarkable way. And since then, we've seen one spiritual high after another. When the plagues came, God drew a line of distinction. It hurt Egypt badly, but it did not touch the Israelites. Israel's firstborn were saved while the firstborn sons of Egypt died. God shows himself as the way maker as he makes a way through the sea. He provides for his people in the barren wilderness. He personally guides their path. God makes a covenant with them, gives them instructions on how to live as the community that has been set apart for God. And finally, we saw last time the construction of the tabernacle so God could dwell with His people. Now, after a season of spiritual highs, the Israelites were riding a wave, experiencing God over and over in so many ways. But now, they finally hit a major spiritual low. They go back on their vows. They break their allegiance to God. It all comes crashing down. Has that ever happened to you? After a series of spiritual highs, mountaintop experiences with God, have you ever hit the rock bottom in your spiritual journey? Everything comes crashing down because the sinful nature within us takes over. Summer is a time for camps. Kids camps, youth camps, Bible camps, retreats. And these can be times of spiritual high. Many people make important spiritual decisions. I'm sold out for the Lord. I'm going to quit sin in my life. I'm going to pursue God wholeheartedly. I'm going to find time in my life to serve Jesus. Lots of key spiritual decisions are made this time of the year. But a few weeks or months later, some people revert back to their old way of life. Their resolve doesn't last very long, and they hit a major spiritual low. And what do we do when we are faced with such spiritual failures? When we stumble and fall flat on our face? Is it all over? Is that the end? Or does God give us another chance? That's what we're going, to, we're going to find in the text we are going to look at today from Exodus chapter 32. So if you're physically able, I'll ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to read Exodus chapter 32 verses 1 to 8. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him, and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. 
When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and go up to indulge in revelry. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Would you pray with me? Father, as we just read this text, we are reminded of the fickleness of our own hearts and how wavering we are in our commitment to you and how many times we let you down. But thank you, Lord, that you are a merciful God. Our sins, they may be many, but your mercy is more. So we hold on to that assurance. I pray that if there's anybody here going through a spiritual low, a setback in their life, that you will speak to them afresh. Open their hearts and their eyes that they will be able to see you. And you will draw each one of us closer to you, Jesus. So we commit this time into your hands. Speak to us now in the power of your Spirit. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I notice this happens a lot in our home. When our kids are doing well, when they get good grades, when they finish all their chores, they get complimented by someone for their good behavior. My wife says, they are my kids. And the emphasis is on the word my. They are my kids. But when our kids get into trouble, when they disobey, when they break the rules, when they argue and fight with each other, I hear my wife say to me, they are your kids. You know, our text does something very similar. Now, all along, God has been saying, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. You are my people, my chosen nation. You are dear and precious to me. And now the people do something really bad. And what does God say to Moses? Your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Huh? Huh? God distances himself from his people. It looks like a, a relationship breakup. God says, it's over. I'm done with you guys. You're so stiff-necked that I'm going to wipe you all out. Stiff-necked. Now that is a farming metaphor. It speaks of an ox or a donkey that refuses to turn its neck towards the direction of the owner. The animal is stubborn and bent on going its own way. And God is saying here, because you insist on going your own way, I am going to do what I did after the flood. I started afresh with Noah. And in the same way, I'm going to wipe Israel out and I'm going to start afresh with Moses. Wait a minute. Is that really fair? Is God being a little too harsh here? Does God respond to our spiritual lows in this way? Does He turn His back on us? Does He terminate His relationship with us because we have failed miserably? Now, before we answer that question, you have to understand the gravity of Israel's sin. We cannot downplay this incident or minimize their offense. Now, consider all that God did for Israel in rescuing them. 
the extent he went in saving them, delivering them, setting them free, bringing them out of Egypt, providing them with all of their needs, water and manna in the wilderness. And if that was not enough, God was giving them a taste of heaven by promising to dwell in their midst. And now, what did the people do? They say, we don't know what happened to Moses. It's time to move on. The text doesn't tell us here in Exodus 32 how long Moses had been gone, what happened to Moses, where did he go, and all of those questions that we have. But we find answers to these questions back in Exodus chapter 24, a few chapters earlier. So let me read Exodus 24, 12 to 18, so you know what happened to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went on up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So now you know where Moses was. God called Moses to meet with him on the top of the mountain. So Moses took Joshua, his aide, with him, and he gave Aaron the responsibility of taking care of the people, and he climbed up the mountain, Mount Sinai, to have a meeting with God. He was gone for 40 days and nights. Now, in the meantime, the people became impatient and restless. Impatience can lead you to do some irrational things. When you're tired of waiting, when you don't know how long, you try to take matters in your own hands. And that's what the people did. Moses had been their leader. He had sacrificed so much on their behalf. They conveniently forgot all that Moses had done for them. And they say with utter disrespect, as for this fellow Moses, we don't know what happened to him. He has disappeared. So we need a new leader. Now Aaron should have had some sense to say to them, cut it out, folks. Don't do this. Moses is our God-appointed leader. He is coming back. He's gone to meet with God. But here's the exchange between the people and Aaron. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, opens with these words. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. And interestingly, that phrase, the people gathered around Aaron, can also be translated, they gathered against Aaron. So a rebellion was taking place. They were ganging up against Aaron using pressure and force. That is no excuse for Aaron to cave in like that, but he does. And he requests that they bring him gold, which was intended to be used in the construction of the tabernacle. Melted the gold and used it to fashion this calf. Verse 4 of our text says, he, Aaron, took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. 
this was Aaron and the people's solution to the perceived problem of God's absence. Moses is gone. God is no longer with us. We need a new God to lead us now. This was an attempt to solve a problem that did not exist. Was God really absent? No. God was not absent from his people at all. How can I be so sure about that? They just picked manna that morning. An expression of God's daily faithfulness in the wilderness, sustaining them each day. So they ate from God's provision and yet questioned his presence. They saw this glory cloud on top of the mountain. God's presence was visible. And yet they asked, where is God? When all they had to do was look back at all the things he had done for them. Now, this was a time for the people to draw inspiration from God's past activity in their life. Instead, the Israelites fell into a spiritual amnesia. Now, recounting on this very incident about the golden calf, the psalmist says in Psalm 106 verse 13, but they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. They soon forgot. Isn't that our problem? How easy it is to forget. Forget what the Lord has done. Forget his mighty acts. Forget his deliverance and go back to our old way of life. And when we question the presence of God so often, it is because of our forgetfulness. We quickly forget what God has done. Quickly lose sight of the spiritual markers in our life, places where God clearly showed up. Now, have you ever, because of this perceived absence of God's presence in your life, turn to something else to provide you with satisfaction, meaning, purpose. For that is the root of most spiritual failures. And rather than questioning God's presence, this is a time to take inspiration from the past of your previous encounters with God. Take comfort from those undeniable moments when God came through for you. You know, ironically, Moses had gone up the mountain to receive instructions for the building of the tabernacle, the very place where God was going to dwell. This was God's instruction for worship. The time that the people had assumed nothing was happening, that Moses is gone, God is absent, something so important was unfolding that very moment. God was giving them the design for how he was going to live in their midst. This is what the Exodus was all about. This is the apex of the book. And instead of waiting for God's solution, the people came up with their own. And they set up this alternate worship system that was contrary to what God had commanded them. Now, why the golden calf? First of all, the word calf there does not necessarily mean a baby animal. It could refer to a young bull. Now, Egypt had a god who was pictured as a bull for his strength. The Canaanite nations where Israel will soon go to and live among them worship Baal, a fertility cult. Worship of Baal was also symbolized by a bull. So the Israelites made this image of a young bull. They crafted it with tools. They fashioned it with their own hands. And in doing so, they broke the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol. Just 40 days had gone by since they made a covenant with God to be his people. In 40 days, the people broke the covenant. 
they were quick to turn back on their vows. Quick to forget all that the Lord had done. Quick to attribute God's glory to a fertility cult saying, we owe our deliverance from Egypt to this young bull. Verse 6 of our text says, so the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And once they started worshiping an idol, they also started imitating the other pagan practices. The word revelry has sexual overtones. There's dancing and singing and sexual misconduct, like an orgy that was going out of control. You know what all of this looks like? It looks like a bride committing adultery on the night of her wedding. Now, how crass is that? Who would tolerate such a behavior? The marriage is over before it had even begun. That is how serious was Israel's sin. And this was not a minor slip-up. This was a renouncing of the covenant obligations. This was total apostasy. When Moses came down from the mountain, noticed all that was happening, he threw the two tablets of the law and it smashed into pieces. And it was not out of a fit of rage he did that, but it was symbolic of how Israel had smashed their covenant with God. And do you know what God says about this failure? This is his response. Verses 9 and 10 of Exodus 32. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Wow. Wow. Does that mean they are now no longer the people of God? Is God done with them? Is he really going to wipe them out and start afresh with Moses? If it had turned out that way, then you and I need to be very fearful. Because when we stumble and fall in our spiritual journey, this is no good news. If that is how God dealt with people back then, then what hope do we have now? But what we see as you read Exodus chapter 32 is fascinating. It is paradoxical. It is difficult to understand. This is a complicated text. But whatever it is, it is grace at work. God is not done with his people. He gives them another chance. God tells Moses, the people are stiff-necked. They're rebellious. They insist on going their own ways. So I will destroy them. I'll wipe them out. And I will start afresh with you and your family. How about that? Now, if you were Moses, that was a tantalizing proposition. Wow. Wow. And Moses would be like Abraham, the patriarch. It will be his family that will go into the promised land and they will have all the spotlight on them. Now we get to the difficult part of this text. Did God really mean it? Was he really going to destroy the nation that he delivered from Egypt? And start all over with Moses. Now let's try to unpack this. If this is what God wanted to do, did he need to ask for Moses' permission? He didn't ask Noah or Abraham's permission. He just carried out his plan. If God's plan was to destroy the people and start afresh with Moses, he could have gone ahead with it. He didn't need to run this past Moses to get his stamp of approval. 
So what is really going on here? What we see in the text is the powerful role of prayer and intercession. God, in essence, was saying to Moses, here is what I will do unless you intervene. This is God's way of inviting intercession to avert an impending disaster. God's intent, I believe, is all along to spare Israel, to give them another chance. And he used the prayers of Moses as the means to bring about this desired outcome. We see the same principle being illustrated in several places in Scripture. When God issues a threat that he's about to do something, and his prophet intercedes on behalf of the people, God relents and changes his mind. That was the function of the prophet, to serve as an intercessor on behalf of the people. For instance, in the book of Amos, God reveals to Amos what he might do to Israel. Amos immediately intercedes on behalf of the people. Disaster is averted. Israel is spared. Another example is Abraham in the book of Genesis. And God says he's going to destroy Sodom. Abraham intercedes on behalf of Sodom, and Lot and his family are spared from the destruction. So in the same way, Moses hears this threat of what God is planning to do, and he interceded on behalf of the people. And Moses appealed to God's plans and his reputation. Lord, you brought your people out of Egypt. Now, if they are destroyed, what will the Egyptians think? Your reputation, Lord, is on the line. And Moses also reminds God of his covenant promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses steps in selflessly, and he's willing to lay his own life for the sake of others. At one point, he even says to God, Lord, you can blot my name, but please spare your people. And we see in the text, God hears the plea of Moses, and he responds to Moses' intercession. Verse 14 of our text says, And the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. So rather than destroying the people, the Lord disciplines them. Rather than breaking the covenant altogether, God decides to work with their failures. God does not send full judgment. He spares them and he gives them a second chance. And despite the people's sinfulness, God extends mercy and forgiveness. Now, as you're sitting here and listening to all that I'm saying, I know what you're thinking. Does God change his mind? The idea of God changing his mind or relenting may be puzzling to us. How is that possible? Is he that fickle? Is God like a parent who says to a disobedient child, you are getting a time out now, and seconds later has compassion and forgives them and lets them go? Is that what we are talking about here? No, when the Bible uses words like God relented or changed his mind, it's using a language which we humans can understand. Theologians have a complicated word for it. They call it anthropomorphism. It simply means the attribution of human traits to God. The Bible does that a lot. We see God's actions presented to us in human terms because that's the only way we can understand. It is for our benefit. So when the Bible says God stretched out his hand, it doesn't mean he has physical hands like us. 
So in the same way, we look at God relenting or changing his mind. It is an attempt to describe God in human language. From humanity's point of view, God changed his mind. But God had known all along what would happen. So in that sense, he is unchanging. God's plan all along was to forgive Israel. And he invited Moses to intercede for this very outcome. So when Moses interceded and he said, God, if you destroy your people, what will the Egyptians think of you? Your reputation is at stake. God didn't have to say, oh, gee, what was I thinking? I forgot that part about my reputation. What will the Egyptians think of me? Thanks for helping me out, Moses. See, that, that is not the God we serve. God used the prayers of Moses along with God's own determination to make his will come to pass. Now that's a lot of heavy stuff for an August long weekend with kids in the worship service. So I apologize for that. But I don't stand here and pretend that I understand everything. There's clearly an element of mystery here. And when we are dealing with a God who is incomprehensible, we should expect for mysteries. We cannot figure it all out with our finite minds. It humbles us and it only puts the spotlight on how awesome our God is. So let me give you a quote from Dr. R.C. Sproul. I'll summarize this part of the discussion and then we will move on. R.C. Sproul writes... Obviously, God is omniscient. God is all wise. God is eternal in his perspective and in his full knowledge of everything. So we don't change God's mind. But prayer changes things. It changes us. And there are times in which God waits for us to ask for things because his plan is that we work with him in the glorious process of bringing his will to pass here on earth. So we are not passive spectators in the entire process, but God uses us to be participants in unfolding his will. You have to keep in mind, the focus of the text is not on God changing his mind, but the focus is on the power of intercession. The psalmist, years later, looks back at this incident and writes in Psalm 106 verse 23, So he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to keep his wrath from destroying them. Picture this. Moses, as the intercessor, stood in the breach between God and the people and he shielded the people from God's wrath And instead of giving people justice, God gives them grace. The chosen one stands in the breach and shields people from God's wrath. Does anybody see a connection here? Moses' ministry of intercession is a foreshadow of the greater Moses, the one who is the sinless son of God who came down from heaven to become one among us. The Bible calls Jesus as our intercessor. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it says, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. See, all of us have spiritual lows in life. We all have shortcomings. We all have setbacks and we deal with our failures. And we rightfully deserve condemnation. 
For a just God cannot overlook any of our sins. But when we are about to be consumed by God's wrath, the Lord Jesus, who is our salvation, He intercedes for us. And Jesus stands in the breach for He took our place on the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And when He said that, Jesus absorbed the wrath of God and He suffered and died in our place. And it is because of that act of sacrifice, our debts were paid for and our victory has been won. Jesus is now our forever advocate who stands before God. So every time we fail, when we confess our sins, Jesus, our advocate, pleads our case. And because Jesus intercedes on our behalf today, we are forgiven and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when you come before the presence of God with a broken heart and you admit your shortcomings, your failures don't separate you from God. Instead, our failures are wiped out for as far as the east is from the west, so far He has removed our transgressions. God throws all of our sin and failure into the sea of forgetfulness and He remembers them no more. That's what gives us hope today, and that is a truth worth celebrating. The intercession of Moses on behalf of a sinful people points to Jesus, our intercessor. So when we turn to God in repentance, he forgives us no matter how we have failed. Even if you have hit rock bottom in your spiritual journey, Jesus gives you yet another chance. His grace reaches out to you. He pulls you out of the raging waters and He sets your feet on solid ground. The worship team is going to come and lead us in a closing song. I'm going to ask all of us to stand. Let's pause for a moment and reflect on what we've heard. As I talk about failures and shortcomings, some of you I know are feeling the weight of it. You know, you have let God down. And what the enemy wants to do to you is far like poor feelings of condemnation and make you feel guilty and ashamed of yourself. And you hear that whisper that you are not worthy. And I want you to picture Jesus as your advocate pleading your case interceding on your behalf. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when we genuinely come before God, acknowledging our failures, know on the basis of the truth of God's word that God will forgive you. He will welcome you with open arms and give you another chance. So let's meet in a moment of silence, close our eyes and reflect on what you've heard. And this is the time God wants to remove those deep feelings of guilt and replace it with the assurance that He has forgiven you. Some of you need that, so hold on to that. Know that Jesus is here in our midst as our advocate pleading our case before the Father, and you are in safe hands. So let's maintain a moment of silence to do business with God, reconcile and restore our relationship with Him, 
And then we will join together with the team in singing and declaring the great things God has done for us.